What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? We're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project. Well, even though there were only three episodes into this year, we're already into the summer season and headed into the later half of 1982, which should tell you how stacked up the later part of this year will be. But on this episode, we're going to hit up some of the ones with no clear release date and also make that annual visit to our favorite bloody camp. Let's start this ball rolling by going to July 9th with a pretty crazy one entitled Raw Force, but I like its other title better, Kung Fu Cannibals. This one starts with a Hitler mustached guy taking a pack of women to a remote island where they're caged up and attacked by robed priests. Meanwhile, the Burbank Karate Club here, and, and I wonder if they're like some sort of offshoot of Cobra Kai, or at least rivals, and they're headed off to an island that's meant to hold an exhibition, and they say that it's haunted by the ghosts of disgraced martial artists. The ship's captain is Cameron Mitchell, and of course the villainous Spear is nearby, working his illegal jade exporting business. Along the way, there's bar fights and some celebrations, including cake, and a cameo from Jewel Shepard in one of her very first ever film roles, as well as Camille Keaton from I Spit on Your Grave. And of course, there's this guy with the most wonderful hair slash facial hair combo going on, and lots and lots of random nudity. Their ship is attacked by this guy who makes the faux pas of wearing a swastika, but then there's also this guy in this outfit, and I really feel like these two would not be in the same gang. They kidnap some of the women on board and the ship wrecks, so our crew has to get to the island and save everyone because it turns out that the priests are taking them for food because they think that eating the flesh of women will allow them to raise the dead. Uh, they're right, and there's a whole bunch of zombies on that island, and it's time to fight! And yeah, the original title of this one, while it was in the script phase, was Kung Fu Zombies and was both written and directed by Edward D. Murphy. And he only made one more movie after this, a more straightforward action flick called Heated Vengeance, and then I, I guess he hung up his hat. Although he did continue to do some random acting as characters with names like Gang Member Number Two and Guy Number One, and was even in Goodfellas as Liquor Cop Number One. One of the editors on this film was a young Jim Wynorski, who would go on to direct a number of classics from the 80s, including Chopping Mall and, of course, Return of the Swamp Thing. It did have a theatrical run and ended up playing in a lot of late-night drive-ins, and it did all right for itself, even if it never really made it big. But over the years, it's developed a pretty big cult following. It's also known for ending with a big old to-be-continued up on the screen, and there was apparently a script for one, and Mitchell had agreed to return, but it never happened. And I like this one, so it gets a 3.5 from me. It, it's silly enough and weird, even if it takes way too damn long to get to the island. Its significance is just a 2, though, since it's not that well known, although its cult is growing and does feature a couple of recognizable faces. Should you watch it? Absolutely. It's goofy fun. For the publicity? Well, sure. I guess you could say that I... You're not doing it for the publicity. I know why you're doing it. Why am I doing it? For the devil. We now go to July 9th for the premiere of a movie that wouldn't get a run in the U.S. until February of 1983, and it's One Dark Night. It had its debut showing in Missouri on July 9th and then had a limited run in December of 82, but didn't go wide until the following year. The coroners arrive at the scene of a mass murder and find six girls dead in an apartment, and some weird stuff happens when they try to move the body of the occult leader that lived there. We then meet a bunch of high school girls in a club called The Sisters, and Dottie's a part of it, and they, they're looking to recruit Agnes of God. There's then the funeral of Raymar, the occult guy, and his estranged daughter is there with her husband, the Cape Crusader, and they meet up with Doc Stater, who claims that Raymar was a type of psychic vampire, and he would gain telekinesis by draining the energy of young women. 
Meanwhile, Julie's boyfriend Steve used to date one of the sisters, Carol, so she has some ulterior motives, and they set her up for the initiation. In it, she has to spend the night in the mausoleum, and it's the one at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And what's crazy is that I've seen several movies projected onto the side of this place, including Jaws, The Thing, and The Shining. Julie then enters alone and navigates the morning side looking hallways while spooky stuff starts to happen, while the rest of the sisters plan to sneak in and scare her, causing drama amongst them. Look for a really quick flash of this guy right here. And it, it's a somewhat rare moment where you're seeing him out of one of his more famous outfits. And it's Kevin freaking Peter Hall, legend. And this guy is the Predator, Harry from Harry and the Hendersons, the mutant bear in Prophecy, and even that alien from Without Warning. Speaking of that mutant prophecy bear, Hall wasn't the only one in that suit, since at times it was also played by a guy named Tom McLaughlin, who wasn't having much luck as a writer, so he switched to trying to direct and ended up getting an investment of $1 million from a Mormon group who only had one condition. The film had to start shooting in three weeks. They got all their players into line, and when the casting director came to McLaughlin with Adam West for the role of Alan, he said no but was persuaded to do so when that casting guy told him that West was having trouble landing roles since he was so typecast as Batman. So Tom relented and put him in. Once everything was shot, there was some drama regarding the editing since it was taken out of the director's hands and completely redone without his input. The producers did this without his knowledge and when it came time for a screening, McLaughlin and co-writer Michael Hawes were shocked to see a different cut, complete with a different ending. The pair were so unhappy with the new finale that they begged the producers to let them shoot one final jump scare to end things on. And they shot one last shot in McLaughlin's garage with the crew working for free. One Dark Knight would be pretty successful, bringing in close to $4 million, which earned enough cred that a few years later, when looking for the next Friday the 13th director, McLaughlin was recommended and he was brought in the helm of part six, Jason Lives. And I give this one a three, and I, and I wish it were a touch higher because this is a cool film. It looks great, it does a lot of great things, but just takes too long to get going. It feels very repetitious in the entire second act. Its significance is a 2.5 because it's never reached that level of success that it could have had, but it did have enough names attached to it and was well regarded. Should you watch it? Absolutely, put it on. Uh, maybe during one bright day, just, just to throw things off. We're headed back across the ocean since on July 14th. In Hong Kong, there was a the release of the movie that I had to include just based on the title alone, Human Lanterns. This has Master Tan here, played by the fantastic Quan Tai Chen, who has paid dearly for this new lantern. And his rival, Lung, is Tony Liu, who has never really gotten the American fame like Jackie Chan or Sammo Hung did, but he was just as badass and in just as many great films. Lung and Tan just can't get along, and in order to compete, Lung has to go by his own lantern from Master Choi. But it turns out that he doesn't make the lanterns, but a formal rival of his does, Chow Fang. He says he'll do it, and very shortly afterwards dons this awesome skull mask, and then kidnaps Lung's girlfriend and skins her alive, and then also kidnaps Tan's sister. And of course, the, the pair blame each other for their disappearances. Crazy fight scenes ensue as our villain continues to kidnap women in their lives and sets them against each other. And what's crazy is that most of the Hong Kong horror that has been featured on the project so far has leaned towards the silly side, since this was the era of that over-the-top, wacky vampire stuff over there. But this is decidedly more horror. It was another effort from the Shaw Brothers, the notorious Chinese producers who made like a thousand movies, but one of their main skills was adapting their martial arts films to the changing marketplace and cashing in on the current trends. And this seems to be a take on the Texas Chainsaw Ed Gein stuff. This has been described online as Hammer meets Hong Kong, and that's pretty accurate. It, it has a European sensibility to the look and feel of the film, and was directed by Chung Sun, 
who had been working with the Shaws all throughout the 70s. The whole movie is stolen by Lo Le as the villainous Chow Chung Fang, who goes over the top playing the devious lantern maker, and holy crap is this one nihilistic. It never really got an American release at the time, but circulated the bootleg catalogs regularly, and finally got a DVD run much, much later. And this is a 3.5. This is just such a gorgeous film and so strange, and it's not very often I get to see some expertly choreographed fight scenes mixed with some gruesome gore stuff. It's HCS. It's just a 1.5 though, so, so it's not known in the US at all. It, it may have more significance back in HK, but since it never got a release here, it's hard to give it any points. Should you watch it? Oh yeah, light, light this lantern. Here's another international entry, this one from Italy, because on July 29th, we got the unveiling of Satan's Baby Doll, which also went by the title Orgasmo de Satana, and begins with a funeral where the dead may not be exactly that, but they say it's just a spasm. The woman is Maria, and her daughter is put in the care of a nun named Saul, and appears as if her husband Antonio is responsible for her death by accidentally giving her too much medication. But he's rich, so the doctor covers it up. Maria also has a brother who's wheelchair bound, who likes to peek in on Saul, who, by the way, is played by Mariangela Giordano, who we've already seen get killed by having a sword ran through her private parts up through her mouth in Patrick Still Lives, and then has her breast chopped off by her zombie son in Burial Ground. So l let's see if she fares better here. So when Miria, the daughter, is called by the corpse of her mother, Ma Maria, Miria thinks she's going crazy, but Maria is indeed up and at him. And this was directed by <laughs> Mario Bianchi, who mostly did porn and was written by Gabriella Crisanti, who at the time was with Giordano. And she had previously starred in a film called Malabimba, the Malicious Whore. And this was a remake of that film. But the twist was that although Crisanti was known for making softcore films, he wanted to make this for the X-rated market. They hired Marina Hedman, a porn star of the era, and wrote in full-on sex scenes. Several of the actors weren't in this world, and Giordano was pushed to a rather explicit, self-pleasuring sequence, as well as scenes of her touching a Ron Johnson. And she says that she was unhappy doing so, and felt used and exploited, and as a result, never worked for or spoke to Crisanti again. Later, there's a sex scene between Maria and Antonio, and the scene was meant to be a standard love scene until Aldo Sambrell, the actor playing Antonio, realized that Hedman was just really gonna go the distance, and he stopped the scene. So instead, they used Alfonso Guetta, the actor who played Ignacio's private parts for the close-ups. It was released in two versions, the softcore one entitled Satan's Baby Doll, but also Orgasmo de Satana, which contained the hardcore bits, and that version ran 15 minutes longer. The weird thing is that both Bianchi and Crisanti have claimed that there actually is no hardcore version, that only the softcore one existed, but that turned out to not be true, as a print was found and restored, and is now available, and is in fact the version I used for this review. And I'm gonna give it a two. It has this great spooky vibe and location and does some good atmospheric stuff, but then just doesn't do anything for most of the runtime and gets super dull. Its significance is just a one since it's never spoken of, hard to find, and doesn't feature any horror mainstays. Should you watch it? You, you can probably pass on this one, unless you're hankering for some porn. We're headed back to the good old US of A for this next one, but it doesn't have a set release date, although it's known to have come out sometime in 1982, and it's Island of Blood, but it also went by the title of Who Done It? It's got a crew headed off to an island for a low-budget film shoot, 
put together by a sleazy mayor, because in horror movies there's never any other kind, and this guy's in it, and you'll either know him as the guy who got shocked a lot in Ghostbusters, or as the guy getting run down by Christine. One of those two. They get to the island and are staying in this resort, and of course, there's no phones there, and only one way off the island, and everyone seems to be on edge. But then things kick off when Phil is taken out as he discovers that the water in the pool is boiling, and he's pushed in and killed while someone plays a song on a Walkman saying, Boil Me. And can we, can we just talk about how they were able to get a whole, whole swimming pool full of water to boil? Do you know how long that would take? I guess they immediately just move on and they're like, well, that was a crappy accident. Well, let's get back to making the movie. Uh, like it was rust or something. But then more murders start to occur all in line with some of the lyrics to that same song. And, and wait, hold up, wait a sec, wait a second. Bunch of people on an island that are being killed off by an unseen stalker with their deaths matching up to the lyrics of a weird song. Is the song Pina Colada Berg? But yeah, one of my favorite moments is when a woman is in the shower and is killed when the water coming out of the spout becomes battery acid and she just stays in there and tries to put her hands up to block it. But it's just a regular shower with a curtain. And we know this because she holds the curtain as she dies. But I don't know, maybe just get out of the way of the water. Just leave the shower. And this little mystery is brought to you by William T. Nod. And this was one of only a couple of films that he directed and is his second to last one. His final film was a 1986 Rocky parody called Ricky, and his couple previous ones were action-oriented, leaving this as his only horror-related piece. What's funny with this movie is that one of the actresses is just on crutches throughout the film, and the only mention of it is a guy saying, You like the idea of the dancer on crutches, huh? But in reality, the part was meant for a girl not with crutches. You see, Janine Marie was cast as Lynn, managed to break her foot just a few days before they started filming. But instead of just getting another actress, Nod just went ahead and had her on crutches all throughout and tossed in one throwaway line to explain it. And yeah, how hilarious is it that this song has lyrics that are like, stab me, boil me, burn me, chop me, spear me, etc. And, and, and let me tell you, this movie is aggravatingly set up to not give you any of what it's promised you. It's about a bunch of people on an island to make a movie, but then the movie has never brought it to play. They're never filming it, and it's just an excuse to get them to the island. The song everyone is killed to seems like it's going to play into things, but then it's just this pointless plot element. It's just in there to be in there. And then it's called Who Done It? It's it's meant to be a mystery, but then honestly, it's barely a mystery, and the reveal feels like a cheat. And yeah, I'm giving this a two since it's pretty damn dull overall, and the whole middle is a lot of nothing. Its significance is a 1.5 since no one's heard of this one, and, and there's hardly anyone in it you'll recognize. Should you watch it? Likely not. You probably want to leave this island uncharted. He's right what he said. The world sucks. Here's another entry with an unknown release date, but this is one more that's just known to have been released sometime in 1982. And this is set somewhere out in Death Valley, with two dudes out in the middle of nowhere who accidentally spot people burying something out in the sand. When they dig up the area, they find a box with a live naked woman inside. So they take her back to their cabin. A couple of women follow them though, and they arrive with guns and take them captive. They're run by a woman named Hesperia and are kept on their commune, and they have some weird stuff go on, like a dual challenge that involves a trick gun that blows a woman's head off, even though we don't get to see it, and they just tell us what happened. Oh, wow, man. Her head's all gone. They decide to bring the boys into their ranks, but have to put them through a series of tests first, and it turns out that the cult has been dealing with a cartel of gun runners. They're trying to sell off a bunch of platinum and the boys start to make themselves at home with the ladies, mostly due to the sexual escapades that ensue. Now, none of this sounds very horror by this point, and it's mostly a silly comedy with elements of a thriller, but it's clear that something else is going on, 
when Hesperia appears to be more than she seems? And this one was the work of Mike Cartel, who also wrote and edited the film. And he also plays the role of Ralph in the movie, while his wife, Mari, handled a number of the other behind the scenes jobs. This would be Mike's only gig as a director, and he only worked as an actor and second unit director on one other movie after this. The story is that this was rushed into production after a different film that they were working on fell through, and they only had 48 hours to pull everything together. Most of the cast was just brought over from that other film, and it was filmed in three weeks. Mike also stepped in and did his own stunt work, including actually being shot with a shotgun while wearing a protective vest. It was shot back at the ending of 1978, but post-production took two more years to nail down, and Cartel continued to shoot additional footage along the way. It's a weird, goofy ride, and, and at one point you can see the very, very obvious string meant to be moving an object on its own. But yeah, even though this shows up in the horror genre section, it's barely, barely so. Were it not for the final couple of shots of the movie, there's a good bet that I wouldn't have included this one at all. But yeah, it's, it's fun though, so I'm gonna give it three tapes, but it's definitely a little sluggish in the middle and weird and disjointed. Its horror significance is a one though, since it hardly qualifies and there's no recognizable faces here. Should you watch it? I'd say yes, but not if you're on the horror hunt. Here's another one with an undetermined release date, with it just being known to have had a run in 1982, and it's The Curse of the Screaming Dead. And oh man, I'm, I'm not prepared for this one. And oh yeah, it's also known as The Curse of the Cannibal Confederates. And, and we have this guy, and I know I'm in trouble when I see this guy, and I'll, I'll explain why in a little bit. Uh, th this group of friends are on a trip together in this RV, and they go off on a hunting excursion together. And one of them is blind. And they, yeah, they wander around in the woods for a while and find an old cemetery. And then there's more walking around. But after a while, they all hear this sound of mysterious bells ringing and it leads them back to that graveyard, which is the remnants of an old church. And there's leftover relics from soldiers that died there. They have an argument about taking everything, but ultimately decide to leave it all alone. But that night, there's a bunch of lights in the trees, and it turns out to be a bunch of Confederate zombies rising from their graves, because it turns out that they've risen since Mel took a diary from the site. <coughs> and they attack. And I guess I should point out that this is a full 50 minutes into the movie. And I should have expected that because this is a sort of roundabout remake of one of the worst movies of all time, a film that I've already featured on the project, 1981's Night of Horror. That one was directed by Tony Malinowski, and so is this. And the lead character is once again played by Steve Sandkiller, and they even have the same camper. Kind of weird that they remade their movie just one year after the original, but at least things happen in this one and the Confederate soldiers are villainous zombies instead of just waiting to be buried. And back in the day, it was released by Troma, who were the ones that retitled it to Curse of the Cannibal Confederates, most likely because they realized that the dead are cannibals and Confederates and are not, in fact, at any point in the film, screaming. In the book, All That I Need to Know About Filmmaking, I Learned from the Toxic Avenger by Troma creator Lloyd Kaufman, he stated that this was one of the five worst films that they ever distributed. But keep in mind, that book is from the 90s and they've had way, way more movies since then. And yeah, sorry Lloyd, I've seen way worse. And I'm giving this a two. Given how awful the Night of Horror is, you're expecting this to be a drag. And the first hour or so is, but the last half hour when the zombies are attacking, that one, that actually had some fun involved. So it gets the two. Its significance is just a 1.5 though, since it's barely remembered, mostly just for the title, and didn't launch any careers. Should you watch it? You can probably pass here, but it's not a total loss. <laughs> 
We're traveling back overseas now and headed to Italy as we break into August, now in the back half of the year. And on August 12th, we had the release of another Fulci banger, Manhattan Baby. This one didn't get a US release until two years later in 1984, where it was titled Eye of the Evil Dead for some reason. In the UK, it got an 83 release and there it was called The Possessed. It begins in Egypt with a young girl encountering a blind woman who gives her this amulet and shortly after, her father is entering an ancient tomb that's been on Earth. But the floor gives way, kills his guide, and he's then blinded. They go back to New York and find out that his vision will eventually return, and they have another kid named Tommy, and oh man, it's Bob! Yeah, the kid from House by the Cemetery is back. And weird things start to plague the family, and little Tommy goes into a magic portal in his closet like his name was Carol Ann or something. When George gets his sight back, he tries to unlock the secrets of that tomb, and the building's security guard is dropped down an elevator, while this guy Luke is sucked into the portal. More random stuff happens, like scorpions and burning hands, but not much makes sense, because this is another dreamlike surreal entry from Lucio Fulci, who we've already covered several times on the project with Zombie, City of the Living Dead, The Black Cat, The Beyond, The House by the Cemetery, and New York Ripper, which was released just a little while before this one. It was a contentious one for the director since he did it for his friend, producer Fabrizio Di Angelis, who had handled all the films I had previously listed, with Fulci. For this film, Lucio had in mind a change-up, and instead of doing gore and practical effects, he would switch to more optical effects and try for a more technological approach. He was promised a budget of around 800 million, but around halfway through the production, that was chopped in half to 400 million lira, by the way, uh, forcing Fulci to alter a lot of his plans. He absolutely hated the end result, calling it a terrible movie, and ended his partnership with D'Angelis over the debacle. He was also quite unhappy with the title of the film, which he wanted to call The Evil Eye, but it was decided to call it Manhattan Baby in an effort to cash in on Rosemary's Baby. Even the title Eye of the Evil Dead was a problem because when Evil Dead director Sam Raimi found out about it, he wanted to sue over it. However, after finding out about all the issues that Fulci had previously faced with films being taken out of his hands, he felt bad and didn't pursue it. And I'm giving this one a 2.5, which I, which I hate to do because I love Lucio and his, I love his movies. He's one of my favorite directors. But this one just does not work. It just does not hold up. And it just doesn't feel like many of his other features. And its significance is the same, because even though it's part of Fulci's roster, it's one of the lesser known ones and it doesn't really have as much staying power as other ones in his catalog did. Should you watch it? Yeah, I mean, it's worth checking out still. It's still actually worth watching. It's just, you know, not one of his best. This next one premiered overseas first, playing in Germany on August 12th and in the UK on August 30th, and then a number of festivals, and eventually was released in the States on VHS in May of 1984. And it's the last horror film, and, th and, that, and that title's not accurate. That, that's like calling your movie the last Amityville movie or something. We meet the maniac himself, and he's a film-obsessed cab driver. And he's really into Carolyn Monroe, because let's face it, who, who isn't? Uh, he plans to make a movie with her and books a trip to Cannes, much to the dismay of his mother. And there's news reports about the assassination attempt on Reagan. And they talk about Hinckley's obsession with Jodie Foster. So Jana is there to promote her new movie called Scream. And there's plenty of footage of the real life festival. And someone seems to be doing some stalking and sending messages with the title of the movie on it. Shortly after, Jana's director is murdered while someone is filming, while Vinny desperately tries to get his movie made. Since the body went missing, the police think it's all just a publicity stunt, and, and, and this is pretty hilarious. This guy is at the police saying they need protection and that a killer's on the loose and is turned away, but then gets a threatening letter 
that he thinks is from a producer and goes to meet him alone at a theater and doesn't think anything is fishy when the lights get turned out. And like, this guy may rival that girl from Bloody Moon for lack of survival instinct. Meanwhile, Vinny further descends into madness, but is he the killer or is something more going on? And this one is by David Winters, who has done everything from horror films to dance films to Alice Cooper concert films. And the actual festival footage was done with no permit. They just went to cons and started getting shots of whatever they could, guerrilla style. So after its minor theatrical run, a number of gorier bits were edited out of the original negative. So the only way it could be seen were inferior VHS transfers. But in early 2023, someone found a full cut with all the scenes intact and they were able to use it to restore a 4K Blu-ray version. It actually was well regarded when it came out and played a number of festivals and won several awards, but didn't really get a wide run in theaters, although it did have a nice life on video. And I'm giving this one a three and a half. I really like this one. It actually had a fun giallo kind of feel to it, but also this strange surrealness about it that I kind of dug. Uh, an interesting mystery with a cool twist ending. I guess it's cool. It's very bizarre. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I like this quite a bit. Check it out. And its horror cultural significance is just a two, though, because I feel like this is one that not a lot of people know about and probably haven't seen, but it does have some genre cred with a couple of known stars. Should you watch it? A absolutely. Make it the first horror film that you watch after this video. Anyway, I can think Baby. of... What is it, Ma? You got a joint? This block ends on a big note because on August 13th, one of the biggest icons of horror was sort of born with Friday the 13th Part 3. This one picks up right where Part 2 left off, although it retcons things a bit. We get this shot of Jason pulling the machete out of his shoulder while still at the cabin. Although the bit at the ending of part two where he smashes through the window has it still in there, showing that to have most likely simply have been Ginny's dream. This one does switch things up though since it has the now infamous disco theme song intro. And right away we get this pole jammed right at the camera. The news tells us it's the very next morning after the last film, so this is picking up right away, and Jason's back, and he steals himself some new non-coverall duds. And then more stuff is poking at the camera because, yep, of course, this is the entry that was shot in 3D. And our boy starts killing right away. We then meet our assortment of doomed teens, including main character Chris, lovable loser Shelly, and I guess Tommy Chong? And then Hunky Rick, who really knows how to charm a lady. I think you've gained some weight since last summer. <laughs> and they're all going up to spend the weekend at Chris's family cabin, where she had a bad experience a few years back. Our big fella starts to murder, taking out a motorcycle gang. And this one has the weird idea that Chris had previously encountered Jason in the woods, and he attacked her. The movie sort of insinuates that he sexually assaulted her, but it doesn't come right out and say so. Although that whole concept seems to go against what we know about this character anyway. Meanwhile, the original concept for part three would have featured the return of Ginny and would involve her being followed to the hospital where she's recovering from her wounds and Voorhees attacking the staff and patients, uh, sort of a version of Halloween 2. But when the actress Amy Steele turned the role down, they went in this direction instead. Steve Miner returned to direct and several screenwriters went through drafts, but the biggest decision was to do this entry in 3D. The entire thing was shot with special 3D cameras that were very difficult to work with and the motions had to be extremely precise, leading to multiple takes of those sequences, bringing a good deal of frustration to the actors who found that their performances were considered secondary to their placement. It was also the first of the series to not be filmed on the East Coast, instead moving to California, although it's still set in the same area. Of course, the most famous aspect of this one is the introduction of the now iconic hockey mask, and that detail was not in the script. It was never specified what kind of mask the killer wore. 
The 3D effect supervisor, Martin J. Sadoff, is the one who is credited with its inclusion. As they were doing camera tests for the movie with the 3D cams, he busted out a goalie mask that he had nearby as a sort of like testing out, and Miner loved it. He asked for a specially made version for the film, and they went forward with it, cementing a place in horror history. It became the first ever 3D film to get a wide domestic release, although some of the screens couldn't quite handle the formatting and had to show a 2D version. It was a big success, earning over 9 million in the opening weekend, a number that broke the previous record for a horror film, which was the original Friday the 13th, incidentally. It would go on to bring in another 37 million, less than the first film, but significantly more than the second one, basically ensuring another sequel. Of course, critics hated it, calling it more of the same, and just a repeat of the previous two films, although they seemed to enjoy the silly camera poking. And of course I dig this one, so I give it a four. But yeah, I do have to say that it, it's really not doing anything that the first two didn't. And, and I think it's a touch dull at times, but it's still, it's still a great time. It's HCS is a 4.5 and it's almost a five because of defining the look of one of horror's biggest villains. But beyond that, the, the movie itself doesn't really impact horror as much as the first film or even the second with the introduction of Jason. Should you watch it? Yep, and wear the glasses to get the full effect. I'm not an asshole. I'm an actor. Same thing. So there you have it. Basically, the summer of 1982. We are getting pretty deep into the year here, and there's a lot of great, uh, a lot of great things to watch in this list. But clearly, my favorite of this batch is Friday the 13th Part Three. I, I do love that film. I think it's uh, a fun flick, even with all the uh, weird 3D poking or whatever. But the characters in that one were were great. Uh, I love the interaction with the gang. Uh, some good stuff going on in that movie. It's it's my favorite of this block. Let me know what your favorite is down below. I want to hear that. If you like the video, hit the like button, make a comment, hit the subscribe button to subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell to get notified when more 80s project is coming, and help support the channel at patreon.com slash movie timelines where you can help keep this going. And let's see, we got still uh, many more episodes. We're not even halfway through the episode count of 1982 yet, even though we're more than halfway through the year. But there's still a bunch more to come right here on The 80s Project.